Hello, hello. From Radio Studio A at Media City, it's Talking Salford. It's your host, Lachlan Campbell, here today as we return to our home studio with another inspiring guest. So over the last 12 months, we've heard from a lot of talented people, people that are actively delivering change in their industries, those who are true leaders in their field, and also from those who are just getting started but have a very bright future ahead of them. Today, we're going to talk to someone who has managed to achieve all her dreams and is a real pioneer in her field. But she is also someone who had to overcome a lot to get there. A big welcome then to today's guest, Caroline Redman Lusher. Hello. How are we today, Caroline? All right, very well. How are you? I'm very well, and thank you very much for coming to join us this morning. So, Caroline is an award winning singer and musician who graduated from our BA Popular Music and Recording program in 1995. She's been a talented musician since learning the violin from the age of four and started singing professionally at the age of 14 singing in clubs throughout her teenage years before she arrived in the Northwest, determined to get a degree and then a record deal. After graduating, she headed down to London, where she took to the local hotel circuit around the West End, singing at the piano during her evenings whilst pursuing a record deal during the day. After a few years, she decided to end the pursuit and move to Farnham in Surrey, where she then took an opening at Sixth Form College in Farnborough to teach music. It was here where she discovered a real passion for inspiring others to read music and after finding quick success with the kids, started up a choir for the local community by putting up a poster at her local coffee shop. This choir went on to become the first rock choir, which is now the world's largest amateur contemporary choir and home to a membership of around 28,000 people across the UK, holding three Guinness World Records. She fulfilled her dream to become a professional recording artist with her voice featuring on songs that have had a million sales in the UK. She was the subject of an ITV documentary series, The Choir That Rocks, has been awarded multiple awards by the music industry, including the prestigious Gold Badge Award, and opened both the 2018 and 2019 BBC Proms in the Park, accompanied by the BBC Concert Orchestra. So before we start, Caroline, I wanted to say... That was a highly abridged version <laughs> of your achievements. Um, as to go through all of them, I think would take the duration it's of today's. very eloquently done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I want to start with the age old question. Where did the love of music truly begin for you? Well, apparently, according to my parents, because, of course, memory is, is difficult when you're a very small child. But um, you could say it started with the top of the pops uh, in my pyjamas, being allowed to stay up late. Uh, to watch that when I was maybe okay. three or four years old. Yeah. Um, and and at four, I was invited by my infant school to begin violin lessons. Uh, the story is that I used to stand up in assembly and sing the hymn to everyone to remind them how it went. <laughs> I just think I was so obnoxious uh, as a kid. Uh, but clear that they were, I think the local... Um, uh, a council, I guess, were looking for kids who were showing some sort of affinity with music and were yeah. given then the opportunity for free to learn the violin. Uh, but I believe there were four of us who were picked and we, we started the violin at four and then the piano at seven. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it, it just grew from there. So that the orchestral kind of classical early years were very early for me right back then. And then it was um, singing lessons from the age of 10. Was music quite a big thing around your house when you were growing up? I, I don't remember it being. I know my dad was really into ELO and we would okay. listen to his albums mm -hmm. of ELO blasting out and his little uh, Triumph Spitfire that he had. And, um, you know, that kind of love of music that he had of artists like that. He was really into Buddy Holly. So okay. the music was there, but um, he played a little bit of piano and he got, got us onto the piano, me and my sister, very early. But no, there wasn't... There wasn't some historical musical gene in the family. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I just loved those pop songs, and even though I was, I was studying classically, it was always, I was always veering back to the dark side. <laughs> it was always referred to the dark side of music. I think your parents must have been very patient with you, particularly learning the violin at, at such a young oh, can age. Can you imagine how <laughs> awful that must have been? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was something you clearly threw your all into right from the off. Um, I mean, in the documentary that you star in, The Choir That Rocks, you say you've been training your whole life to be a pop star. So, so when, when did the <laughs> yeah. moment come that you thought, no, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to really become one? I think it was, I was 10 and I was leaving junior school to go into senior school and um, Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero was released. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that one? 
Mm. Well, I, I remember the song. I don't remember when it came out. Obviously. Well, I, I must have. I think I must have been ten or eleven. Yeah. And I learned to play it at the piano because this is when you could buy the the single sheet music. You know, you go yes. into a shop and pick that up. And I learned to play and sing it. And I played it in assembly as my final goodbye <laughs> to my junior <laughs> school. And it was very rock and roll, very heavy piano kind of rock and roll and um, and I then performed it as part of a classical concert that the orchestra I was in was performing and the teachers didn't know what I was going to do but they, they put it in the programme and mm. I sat there and, and it was it was really interesting to see that the parents were thrilled that there was something pop, yeah. rock and roll and the classical teachers were horrified that I'd, <laughs> I'd brought this into their, their concert. So there, there, there's been, it's interesting, right from the beginning there's been an uh, a reaction from certain classical individuals that I've come across through even recently through yeah. my career who don't like it, who don't agree with it. And yet the pop music world that, that can give so much joy and is, is around us every day is, is huge for everyone. Um, so, you know, finding that song, that Bonnie time and getting that reaction from the audience did tip me into thinking, yeah, yeah, this is it for me. As we grew up, you know, before we, we were allowed to go into pubs um, and bars, that my friends would come and sit in in a, in the music. My, my dad built an extension to, to house the piano. I think it was because of the violin. He wanted me out of the way. But there was an extension at the end of the house that he built for me. And they'd all sit in there and we'd just go through songbook after songbook, playing and singing. And uh, it was a big part of the social life back then to come round to our house and, and sit and play like that. Oh, your, your dad sounds like he was a massive influence you growing up. But what other kind of teachers did you have around you back then? Well, I was fortunate enough. I won a music scholarship and went to a girls' school and was there right through um, until coming here, actually, up to okay. Salford. Yeah. And the, the staff, it, the music teacher, I mean, I'm friends with her now, uh, and the drama teacher, those mm. are my two kind of go-tos. And everyone, even the headmistress, they were all so supportive of the music, but I was really the only music scholar going through that whole school it wasn't a particularly it wasn't a music school it was it was mm -hmm. a, a, a secondary school yeah so um i was given all the lessons i wanted all the opportunities but really i i think i just made them for myself um because of that i got that job at 14 mm. singing in a nightclub <laughs> Telling. yeah let, let, let's talk about that because that that's an interesting story isn't it caroline so, so <laughs> how did that happen well, my sister used to drive me around to karaoke nights to try and win the cash. And okay. um, she was two years older than me. Uh, and we would uh, go to various places. And there was one night when I was, I was up singing and she was talking to the manager who owned a restaurant attached to this club. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, well, my sister can play and sing at the same time. And he said, well, let's get her in now. And he opened up the restaurant. There was a baby grand there. And he said, come and play a couple of tunes for us. So I sat and played and he said, would you like a job entertaining on a, I think it must have been a Friday night. Mm. And uh, and he said, uh, I'll pay you 40 pounds. I thought, oh, 40 pounds. Money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I shouldn't have been in the club. I was underage. Yeah. And actually, my, you know, my, well, I think my sister must have been 17 because she was driving at the time. But um, so I just began the the big lie, which was, that I was actually 21 and I, I mean wow. I'm six foot I, I was able to get I was tall <laughs> I'm, I am tall so I could get away with it I'm confident yeah. and my advice to myself was just be quiet just stay quiet when mm. you're talking to people so that no one <laughs> asks any questions and it was from there that I then was um, somebody spotted me there and said look they're looking for someone like you up in the centre of Birmingham mm. at a nightclub called Liberties on the Hagley Road and it was a famous 21 plus nightclub yep. and um and he actually took me up there and i auditioned and the manager it was a white baby grand in this place and it okay. and it was um i'm afraid it was a cd it was a cd nightclub cd place yeah and he said how much do you charge and i said well 40 pounds thinking okay i got i get 40 now. he said uh oh what per hour and i uh yeah Ooh, it's okay. okay. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And at the end of the night, I was walking away with like 160 cash. Wow. Um, I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't doing it for the money. I wasn't, no. you know, my friends were working in boots on a Saturday and, and mm. um, it was, it was meant to be pocket money. I, I was doing it because I wanted to be, a, I was, I was going to be a pop star. And yep. that was that. And, yep. and, and this was a, a no brainer to go and learn my craft and be at the piano. And, and in the end, someone from there then then pulled me into another bar in Birmingham. So in the end, I was doing two nights a week up in cent central Birmingham, singing and playing all night. And then I was at school studying 
uh, and they got wind of it. The school got wind of it, but they were more fascinated than upset. They were very supportive. Remarkable double life, Caroline, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sounds a little bit to me as if, you know, all the kind of the superhero films that we get these days, it's like you're almost like a superhero, kind of like pop star. It's like you're a schoolgirl by day and, and pop, star by about a pop star by night. Pop star by night. Exactly. <laughs> um, at any point, and did you have any voices, I guess, around you kind of saying, oh, being a pop star that that happens to one in a million like that that's such a, a big dream was there any doubts that were kind of in your head at any point when you were growing up and wanting to t- take this goal on no no nothing actually and the, and the school it was interesting even now I get asked about the school because it was all girls were we ever up against um any male dominated mm. industries and 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 that and I said no I don't remember anything I don't ever remember being told I couldn't do what I wanted to do uh, but I was I was driven and I was adamant mm. that I was going to. And as I'd left that junior school, going back to when I was 10, um, I hadn't been awarded the Music Cup. <laughs> and and this girl called um, Jenny Bomber mm. got oh, given Jenny. this Music Cup. I know. <laughs> and, and I was absolutely beside myself. How yeah. dare they not <laughs> give me this Music Cup? I'll show them. And I think it was the first moment of of that needing to prove something that I'll sh- I'll I'll get that record mm. deal and I'll show them they should have given me that music <laughs> that's just really and it is a, it is a character trait of of the entrepreneur that, yeah. that you're driven by needing to prove mm-hmm. something um but all the way through you know uh I think it'd been it'd been music for me right from from being very little so mm. I, I don't think there was any doubt from my family that I couldn't go off and do something yeah. the only moment really I guess was when I was in London and as I left London after four years uh, that there was a big discussion with my dad yeah and you're right my dad is is we are very close where he said do you think you really just need to stop now and mm. stop pursuing this and it was um a terrible conversation to have and I mean, it wasn't because he didn't believe in me it was because I wasn't getting anywhere and I, I'd ended up um uh, with asthma because of the cigar smoke yeah. this was before the ban and he came to see me in um, one of the very posh hotels called the Lanesborough it's right on Hyde Park Corner and um, there were men sitting all the way around the piano with a big cigar ashtray in the middle and you could hardly see across to the bar for the smoke and I was taking in all this smoke and trying mm. to sing and he was sitting there and of course it was a bit seedy again with the Sound, men yeah, and, and like, yeah. there was my dad and I was embarrassed because my dad mm. was watching and you know, I thought, oh, this this isn't the, the great night for him to see me in action. And mm. he just said, do you think you should call it a day? It's it's such a, it's so lovely to you to speak so candidly about what was obviously quite a hard time mm. in your life, Caroline. Um, and we, we've jumped a bit ahead. So I just want to bring us back to um, Salford, because uh, this was a big journey from home for you. So, and we talked about this previously, but you want to kind of tell me a little bit about what it was about this course here at Salford that jumped out to you, why you had to come to Salford to study? Well, at that point, so um, being 18 years old, it was, should I pursue classical music because of the violin? Mm-hmm. Uh, or wh- how on earth could I pursue popular music, mm-hmm. contemporary music? And I started auditioning at the traditional kind of music places, taking my violin along and traveling mm-hmm. around the country, looking at it all. And then the 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 head of my sixth on college came to me one day and said, I've got I've got your course. I found your course. And it's popular music um, at Salford. I went, oh, you mean they're doing a course in popular music? So it was this revelation mm. that, oh, I totally abandoned all the other courses yeah. that I was looking at. And I and we, we, we started reading up on what did I have to do. And it was, do you know, it was an ordeal to get on that course. I don't know if it's the same now. I don't think it is the same, but I think, as you say, it was quite exclusive at the time. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I was told there were uh, 2,000 applicants and 40 places. So so a challenge. Yeah, then, yeah. I like a challenge. Yeah, but you, do, you clearly <laughs> do love like a challenge. A challenge. Uh, I remember it just being three stages. It was uh, a written exam. That was mm-hmm. hard. Uh, based on the technology, MIDI, all the kind of recording, all, all the, mm-hmm. the acoustical engineering, all the side of things that I thought, oh, no. And then there was the um, interview. Yeah. And then there was the actual audition. Yeah. That was the last stage of it. And I offered violin, piano and voice. So I didn't know. And I, I played them a song I'd, I'd written. And mm-hmm. and they said, oh, you know, if you're successful, we would want you to study voice. And um, and then I had to wait. Each time I had to wait, had I got through to the next oh, stage? Yeah. Was I invited back? And it took took a number of months. 
And then in the end, I was just waiting for this letter to come. Had I got a place? Mm. Uh, and this letter didn't come and I was getting more and more anxious. And in the end, I thought, oh, I'll just ring. I'll just ring them. And I, and I got through and he said, oh, yes, you're on my list. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. So I took the news in into the college and told the head and they had this big moment um, where everyone celebrated and cheered oh, that I got on the course. And that was that. Um, so so let, let's talk back then about London then. So this was obviously um, the route that you saw into the industry. Um, do you think it's a viable route that people could go down now? What, physically getting themselves into Physically London? getting themselves in and, and doing what you were doing where you were seeing a lot of around the, the hotels around there. Is that is that a viable route now or is that route now dead in the water, do you think, for singers? Do you know, I, I, I think... A lot of it, and, it, and it's it's that old saying, is it right place, right time? Mm. Um, contacts, 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 getting yourself in front of people, meeting people. I mean, looking back, no, I, I understand why it didn't work. I was, mm. I was entertaining um, tourists and VIPs. I mean, mm. the hotels, at least the hotels I was in, it was attracting celebrities. And I remember Sting walked in one night and he just sat in front of me. I thought, no, <laughs> Sting. I was just sit, sitting, playing Elton John songs and singing yeah. at the piano, thinking... Can't you just come up to me and, and invite me to be your backing singer? Can't yeah. we? Can't you just do that for me tonight? <laughs> or, and Pavarotti used to stay there, and I, I met a huge amount of celebrities in that place. And there were occasionally music producers who came in, but mm-hmm. there was there was dod- there were dodgy people out there as well. You know, it was um, quite a few really horrible experiences with producers having responded to the stage and yeah. auditions and things. Um, you know, it is what people think it is at times. Um, but you know the 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 record deal you need to be out gigging you need to be seen mm. you need to just make those contacts and and with, with with today's technology social media i mean it you can you can approach people and learn about people so much um, more easy than than yeah. when i left when yeah. i was on my own in london I suppose you can sell yourself a lot easier to people in terms of being a musician, being able to get your content out there on various different platforms mm. which back then just just wasn't a viable route mm. um if you could go back and talk to um, the Caroline that was in that situation then, what kind of thing would you have said to her? Would you have told her, right, you just need to get out of this, this isn't going to work out? Well, I don't know. I don't like, I I, I don't look back and regret anything, mm. really, because you make the decisions at the time based on how you're feeling and it's hard to then feel that again later on. Yeah. Um, but in the end, I won. So... But exactly. I won in a very different way mm-hmm. to how I thought. So leaving London actually did did lead me yeah. to where I needed to go. Uh, and I and I think you know we all have to make really difficult decisions. Sometimes it's the lesser of two evils. Uh, and at the time you think is this the right thing to do? But you, you do end up making a decision for a reason, and yeah. and that's what leads you forward. So um, you know if something is really obviously not working, then yeah, get out. Yeah. So you, so you, your dad intervenes, and you have the the really hard conversation you come back to sorry um and so if if this was if this was your your big story this would be the part where you basically lose to the villain in the first showdown so what was it that got you back up on your feet with that opportunity at this college did it how did that materialize was it through contacts was it through did people knew that you were a singer or that you could read music how did that happen yeah i got a call from the sixth on college from the 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 vice principal saying we'd heard that you were in Surrey. Mm. And I thought, well, I don't know who... I mean, I must have reached out to local musicians. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they said, would I would I come in and talk to them? So I, I went in and, and they said, we want you to come in and be an A-level teacher. And I said, well, I've, I don't have a teaching qualification and I've never taught before. I taught one-to-ones, you know, mm-hmm. singing lessons. And and chatted with them quite, quite a while. And they said, listen, your your personality is going to be the winner. Yeah. And and we think you're, you're going to be great with the mm-hmm. kids. Would you come and do it? And I said, yeah. sure. Okay, let's do that. And um, it was life changing. And I, oh, I loved those kids. And each every two years they they left and I cried. And and, and I said, I'll never feel the same. Oh yes, another group of kids come in. Oh, I love you so much. <laughs> and uh, the nice thing about performing arts A level is they wanted to be there. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and no, they were exactly. really nice kids. Good. So um, uh, and and it was it was great. And I realised um how much I loved teaching. And being in front of the car, I didn't like all the management stuff behind the scenes and all the boring stuff. But um, but prepping for them and leading them through those lessons and 
and getting them through their exams and the social life that went with it. Well, not social life, but the social aspect yeah, of yeah. performing arts. Um, and I thought, oh, OK, this is this is right. This is where I'm meant to be. But there was there was always this niggling. I didn't quite get that record deal. You know, mm. I didn't quite and have I let myself down. And I ended up doing night uh, night classes, evening classes to get my qualification as a teacher. Mm. So I was doing full time and then two nights a week. Okay. Uh, and then even when I qualified you know my, my my team was celebrating with me and there was this just this voice going oh, wasn't what you were meant to do uh but but I thought well at the at the time I, I loved it and it was mm. great fun and 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 I was there for a number of years uh and and developed the lunchtime choir concept for them there which of course was was the life cha- the pivotal moment yet again yeah so I I feel I was meant to and I learned a lot it was a great college um uh, 3,000 students and I, I was trained really on the job and I, I all the things that I have to know for rock choir a lot of them came from that time being at the college as a teacher what was it about your approach for the students that seemed to just click well I was I was in my mid-twenties so they were 16 to 18 years okay. old so there wasn't a huge age gap mm-hmm. age gap we liked the same artists okay, you know, and we yeah. had the so we, we enjoyed the same thing and I would I just I hadn't come through a, a formal teacher training background, so I just went in and did what I thought was okay a lot of the time. Uh, you know, if their mobile phone went off, I'd deal with it, and I'd mm. sort them out a date with whoever was ringing, and, you know, <laughs> then they never turned their phones on again. And, you know, and I, I took them to Disneyland Paris to perform a number of times. Oh, and, and, nice. um, uh, and I, uh, you know, it was, it was um, music, drama, dance, so I was mm. working in the field that, that I loved the most. Yeah. And, um, and I was, I was often given the kids who couldn't read music. I was given the kids who really didn't, we didn't know what to do with them. And I would guide them and shape and mentor them and get them through. And uh, and a lot of them stay in touch with me now. That's nice. Yeah. 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 So rock, rock Choir has massively taken off since you launched it back then. And it just seems something that seems to just get bigger and bigger. It's had many huge moments along the way. At what moment for you was its proper crown and achievement? Mm. Well, 2018, we opened the BBC Proms in the Park. Yeah. And I was invited to bring my team on stage. It was a professional environment. So the members who take part in Rock Choir are the amateur singers, the general public, and then my team are the experts. They're, they're the amazing um, teachers, singers, musicians. So I was invited to sing with my team with me. So I had mm-hmm. 80 of my team singing with me on stage in front of the BBC Concert Orchestra. And we were able to negotiate... 10,000 discounted tickets for 10,000 of the members to come and stage a flash mob. So it was all secret. So out of 40,000 in the audience, 10,000 were mine. <laughs> were, you yeah. were with me, were on my side. And, uh, and, and on my queue, they stripped down to their uniform. Mm-hmm. And we went into this full dance routine and singing routine. It was the, it was the best thing ever. And, um, and we'd done a big run of PR leading up to it. Uh, Chris Evans' show. I'd been up here actually, sat on the couch, BBC. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of attention on us, and um, it was live on Radio Two. Red Button. <laughs> it was quite precious, yeah. but it was when 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 those Rocky we call them Rockies when they stripped and they because I I was looking out thinking I really hope you're out there because we're about <laughs> to do this. I don't know if you're out there. And, and then and then they did it and we were there and together and it was it was a very emotional, hugely successful yeah. moment. And there'd been a lot of trauma leading up to that event mm. behind the scenes. Um, one of my team just as soon as I started singing just was sobbing apparently in the wings because we'd got there and we got it and we got it done and we were there. Um, and I remember being on a on a high. This is really weird high, for I counted sixteen days afterwards when I actually walked around like I was floating because it had been such a success. Yeah, wow. we. I, I mean, no drugs involved. Honestly, it was just literally <laughs> natural high. Just natural high. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, and and uh, and it, it what, something had gone viral after. I mean, I just you know it 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 it, it was the best it was the best experience because the team my team had bond were bonding there were lots of boxes I always try and tick loads of boxes yeah. when we do these things um you know the attention on us was huge you know that the, the rock choir logo was massive behind us behind the orchestra mm-hmm. um a friend of mine he's head of apple and uh and i went to him and i i was saying about something and he showed me a photograph of the the logo 
like in massive size behind the orchestra. And he said, how did you manage this? The BBC will not let me use any Apple, you know, advertising. I can't do anything. And yet you get your logo. <laughs> and I said, I don't know. <laughs> they just really like us. <laughs> you know, it's all about contacts and yeah. being nice to be. Not that he isn't like that. But um, yeah, it was it was it was one of the best moments um, in terms of being recognised by the BBC yeah. and, and being invited to do mm-hmm. something like that that put them under a lot of pressure. They had we had to fulfil their event to make mm-hmm. sure we were doing the good. And then they invited us to do it again the next year. Yeah. So and we would we were actually invited to do it the following year, but of course pandemic, pandemic. hit. Mm. So what would be its next big step, do you think, with Rock Choir? Because it's now such a massive organization, mm. really embedded across the UK. Is international something that you want to try? And we do? often we often talk about going in, uh, going abroad, America, Australia. We've got one member in Australia. Just, just the one. <laughs> just one. <laughs> online. <Aww. laughs> he loves it online. I say, oh, feel we need to come over and say hi to you. Um, Germany as well. Okay. I'd like to do Germany. They have a big um, uh, connection with eighties rock, yeah. which is uh, okay. one of my favourite. One of your favourite genres. Yeah, yeah. In, anything from the eighties. Um, but I, I, you know, the, the, there's a whole side to Rock Choir, um, which is about the well-being of the membership, mm-hmm. and the members are actually they're dominated by women, uh, age probably I'd say twenty to to ninety, ninety-five. Um, we have a, a range of ages, and their well-being and their connection with Rock Choir and, and their experience is absolutely the most important part of this. And yes, we love doing the proms and we love yep. doing all these shows and releasing albums and doing all sorts of things, but actually they're on the ground, their weekly experience is the most important because it keeps them going. And even last night I was in Sheffield and I met 200 Rockies last night and they were queuing to tell me how Rock Choir had changed their life and how important it was that they wanted to thank me. And in turn, I thank my team because Mm -hmm. they're all doing it with me. Um, But harrowing stories. Um, life, just life stories of, I say just as if, if it's, but it's common, c- cancer, divorce, empty nest, bereavement, um, loss. Uh, there was a lady who today was going in for, I think, her sixth operation on uh, cancer. It's just spreading. Um, but she was so joyful and grateful. And I just wanted to put my arm, well, I did. I put my arms around her and I was thinking, oh, I'll be thinking of you tomorrow. And, and all her rocky friends are kind of round her almost... Mm keeping her going and, and being bubbly around her and, and telling them all the things they're going to bring in to hospital to look after afterwards and all the songs they're going to be rehearsing together. Uh, and, of course, the use of music that, um, in our lives. That Now, this is a technical bit. Endocannabinoids are released. You might know this. Endocannabinoids are released when we sing in the brain. Cannabinoids, the natural high. So that joyful experience that we, we experience when we've been singing along in the car or in a choir, if anyone's in a choir, that is actually a real thing that's happening. And that those endocannabinoids can last for days and give someone high, the natural high. So last night, when I went in, when I'm on tour. I, I, I'm doing 80 nights. I just did night 78 last night on tour. And I'm as soon as I get out of the car, I'm going for it in terms of energy yeah. and um, joyfulness and, and funny stories I'm telling them and teaching them um, flash dance, what a feeling that I taught them last night and getting them onto that high that will last a good few days. So someone like um, this lady last night is going in today for her operation will just be a little bit, I guess, I won't say happier because how could you be happy going in, I don't know, for an operation like that, but just better and stronger and, I don't know, braver Yeah. because of last night and because of the songs and because of the friends that are going to go, go in with her that she met at Rock Choir. And as we go through life, you know, it's easy at university to be in the canteen and meet loads of people on your course. But as you go through life, unfortunately, those opportunities become less and less. And it's mm. difficult to meet and socialise, especially if you move across the country. Yeah. How do you meet people? And anyone coming into Rock Choir will immediately make friends. They're part of a club. They're part of something special. And... Um, we try and get these communities working together all the time, sharing concerts, meeting one another. Some people become pen pals. They go off on holidays together. Uh, I heard about a knitting group last night, like a sub rock choir knitting group, arts and crafts, wine, pub crawling group. You know, all, all these things happen because they meet one another. And and it's really, you know, there's so many aspects to rock choir, so many elements to, again, tick the box. But really it's it's the Rockies and their well-being that is is always the reason to get up every day because they're so special 
Caroline, I got a little bit lost in your story there. That's so touching, so beautiful to hear about the things that Rockies do and and how your choir has affected them. Um, so the question I'm going to ask you now is, um, well, hopefully lift my mood a little bit because that was that was very emotional hearing all oh, about sorry. that. You know, I'm crying. No, I cry all the time, literally all the time. Cry, well, cry. No, I can, ima- I can imagine if you hear all those stories when you're on tour, but... So let's say right now that I love to sing. And just to be clear, I am I am a terrible singer. No, you're not. Okay. Come on. <laughs> Where's so, the piano? <laughs> so so I, let's say I walk into Rock Choir. I'm strolling in. I come to the organiser and say, hello, I want, I want to sing. What kind of experience am I going to get? So, um, first of all, we hope you would have read up a little bit because mm-hmm. you'll be wanting to know before you walk into that room. Yeah. can take actually someone months to get into the room they'll park in the car park and they'll watch people and they won't come in because they're too scared so you get a you get a variety of people coming you would have gone onto a website put your postcode in it would show you various rehearsals and you would choose which one you then go along and it's free because we want you to just see if you like it Mm because it might might not suit some people um you would walk in you would be met by a prefect at the door a prefect and i'll call them prefects because of the girls school i went to okay yeah. Uh, i just decided to call them prefects because they are um not totally in charge because the rock choir leader the musician is in charge but they are there to help so they'll be at the door they'll be expecting you they'll say oh what's your name and you say oh there's my name and you tick it off yep. you're given some lyrics and then you'll you'll say they'll say where would you like to sit where do you feel your voice is low middle high mm-hmm. that's all so we don't throw anything technical at you because we don't want to put you off we yep. don't want you to feel you're walking into a i don't know elite type choir where you've got to read the music or anything and then and then we might introduce you to the rock choir leader um and then you the, the session begins. Hopefully you've chatted to people around you and we warm your voice up. So we'll be doing some vocal exercises mm-hmm. and some physical exercises. Usually the physical is a bit of dancing, just stepping and clapping though. Don't yeah. freak out. It's okay. <laughs> it's not really dancing. Um, to, to some latest chart song that we'll yeah. have. So the, get, get the room, the atmosphere. So already as you walk in, the music is playing because mm. we want to set the ambience. We want some really cool tunes playing. And then um, you'll be using your lyrics. There's nothing on your lyrics that is musical in terms of the terminology. Uh, there's no theory on there. It's But it might be that there's um, some sort of annotated sections just to help you, to guide you. Yeah. And then we begin the song. So they'll be at the keyboard with their head mic. This is the rock choir leader. Uh, and you'll be you stay seated and they might say, OK, um, anyone in the bass section, the low, lower voice section, um, I'm going to sing a phrase, you're going to sing it back. So it's taught by rote. And you gradually build up. Everything's working in your head. It's more complicated than Sudoku, I can tell you. Uh, your brain is working. Um, you're listening. You're having to memorise. You're looking at your score. You're back and forth. You're repeating. You're repeating. Then the leader will move to the next harmony section. And then we build up and build up those harmonies. It could be even at its most 10-part 10, 10 harmony, depending on the size of the choir. Mm-hmm. And then you're practicing, you're hearing the other voices in the room. And as the song gets taught, maybe two to three weeks of rehearsals nails one song. You're then recapping songs. You obviously wouldn't have known those songs because you've just walked in the door. Mm -hmm. But you might go to the front and have a listen and go, oh, wow, I love that song. I'm going to learn that one. So the resources are then available to you on our website. There's a members area. Um, So tuition, uh, video resources, everything is available to you as a whole package after the song. The song's taught first and then that's available. Um, and then you go away and you th- you say, oh, I'm on this weird high now and now I'm going off for a, for a beer with the bass section because um, it turns out my neighbour's son is in that. I didn't realise you were in this choir. Oh, let's go down to this pub. Oh, I've suddenly got some new friends. Of course I'm going to come back next week. I can't wait. Oh, and the show is in six weeks. I better get my T-shirts on ready. And how was they a weekly thing? Yeah, weekly thing. Yeah, ten week term academic, ten week term, yeah. and then we share we we do workshops and events over the holidays. Yeah. Well, that, that was very comprehensive. Oh, that's all right. Thank you very much. Well, I, I do now want you to do that <laughs> and join. <laughs> oh my word! I mean, so I'll be honest. I, I was in bands. Oh as yeah. A teen- I was in bands as a teenager. God, I'm talking about as the lead singer. Or um, oh, I tried. <laughs> I tried. I tried. Um, my mother uh, was very honest with me that I was not blessed uh, oh. with a good singing voice. Uh, but I, I like to think I had a nice voice. Um, <laughs> but it, it really. And you're going to prove to everyone right now <laughs> by singing <laughs> us. As much as um, I think everyone would enjoy that, I, I don't think. Oh, yeah, no, no. I, I, the I, crowds are cheering I, here. I, I, I think if anyone is going <laughs> to sing in this room, I think it's going to be you, <laughs> um, One thing I absolutely want to talk about. Mm. Um, is your record deal 
Oh yeah. Because you you kind of teased me about this previously about how oh, it's it's such a great story. So so how did you finally land this deal then? Right. So a few years into Rock Choir, rock, so Rock Choir began um, as I left the college. Uh, 2005 and by 2009 I had about a thousand members and I had my first rock choir leader working with me and this is all round Surrey Mm -hmm. and I got a I got a call from an uh, a journalist who wrote for the Telegraph saying could I could she interview me about what I was doing she got wind of what I was doing so I went up to London I did a very formal interview at the Institute of Directors with her she and she was quite frosty and I thought oh god is this going to be okay it's just she understand what I'm trying to do and it came out on the Sunday Telegraph and it was a it was brilliant, this piece. I was so relieved. And then I immediately got a call from the editor of BBC Breakfast saying she'd read this piece. Would I go on and be interviewed? And yep. they wanted to send David Silito to create a short film about what I was doing. Lovely. So it was a it was a big a big piece that they were doing and, and um and the angle really was that there wasn't anything else like this. And I remember I had 12 choirs at the time and I've I've got four hundred now, so it shows you the mm. difference over eighteen years. And they, they came and did an interview and we staged it all and it was exciting. And then they called me up. Um, and this is when the BBC were in London still. So yes. they called me into London overnight because uh, they secure you in a hotel. They don't let you out because they, cause they need to know that you are going to be on that couch in the morning because they then talk, talk you up before you get on. Yeah. And um, and yeah, so I went on on the couch and it was the most frightening thing I have. Ex- I mean, I've done it quite a few times now. I'm fine. It's fine now. But that first time, oh. It was just, I thought, who in their right mind, you know, would sit and talk to 12 and a half million viewers live at God knows what time in the morning. But it was this really funny moment because it was the 1st of April, so it's April Fool's Day. Mm. And um, Obama had arrived in the UK for the first time and they were about to go live to 10 Downing Street to see him walk out of 10 Downing Street. And they said to the editor, said, I'm really sorry, but we might have to cut cut you mm, and I thought oh, I've been up all night yeah. I'm really stressed I just want to get this interview done and I and I, and I said well because I was meant to go on at nine and I said look can't you switch me with the Botox interview that comes after me and cut her mm. I mean who need, who wants to you know and she said that's a great idea <laughs> so so I secured it um, wow and and it happened and, and it was really funny because because there were loads of uh, juniors in the choir at the time little ones and the parents had kept them off school to watch this interview and, and I oh, promised it was at see. nine and then it was at ten past nine so I was well, I was very aware that, <laughs> that oh, there were people oh, watching yeah. anyway I did the interview and it was great and um, as I left I got back to Waterloo to go home on the train and there was a call um, from a chap who no it was a message it was a text message or a call I can't remember there, there was some communication but it was I didn't know the number and I mm. thought oh, the BBC had given out my number to someone okay Anyway, I thought it was an April Fool's joke. And I was on the train going, oh, it's an April Fool's joke. And I went to text back saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was no yeah, voicemail yeah. or anything like no, that? Then. No, no, it was a, yeah. They were saying they're from Universal. Okay. And I thought oh, it was a joke. Mm-hmm. And then my husband was with me and he was on the phone to our music lawyer. And he said, oh, Caroline's had her first horrible, you know, reaction or whatever it was, joker. And um, and, music, and he said the name music. And I went, no, 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 no. That is <laughs> that is the guy. Is that that he's the chairman of of Univer- of Decca Records. I went, oh, oh. So I quickly deleted what I was about to write and <laughs> said, hi, <laughs> hi. Anyway, I I actually thought it was Universal. I thought it was a movie. I thought I th- I was thinking films. Right, you were thinking Universal. From and films. they said, can we come and see you tomorrow uh, in Farnham? I said, oh well, I'm. And I'd just been also booked for the Paul O'Grady show, so I. I said, well, I'm up in a couple of weeks. Do you want to meet in a couple of weeks? And they mm. said, no, no, we're going to come down tomorrow to Farnham. I'm like, oh, okay. And I went back to my little office, which was a shed in the garden at the time. And um, the, the girls who were helping me just said, there's like 5,000 emails that just come in from your your thing on BBC Breakfast. So we, we were suddenly overwhelmed Whoa. with a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, they were trying to wade through this and um, said, oh, there's Universal have emailed as well. I said, oh, no, no, I've spoken. Anyway, they came down the next day um, and it was it was a commercial director of Universal mm-hmm. who became head of Apple, who's a friend of mine now. And it was also um, the head of A and R for Decca. Okay. And and they sat there and and they and they said we'd like to offer you a four hour album record deal. <laughs> I just had this, and knowing knowing the history of how much I'd wanted a yeah. record deal, and I had not planned for this. I didn't set this up. You know, this was a real. Mm. side kind of it just came in 
anyway, I, I just was absolutely, I didn't know what to say, which is rare, as you can tell, because <laughs> I like to talk. Um, and I just went silent. And it's Brian Rose, who, who was, who, who's become a friend now, he, he laughs about it because he said he thought I was playing hard to get when I went quiet, but I was just... <gasps> just on, and yeah. he got out all these pie charts and, and um, information about how well Universal were currently doing in the market in terms of a record deal. <laughs> but you didn't really care and about I, that. I, I was just like, he was trying to prove, because they were worried I would sign with someone else. They, they, they thought I was okay. about to get a lot of attention. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I just said, oh, I'll have to think, I'll, I'll, I'll go in and think about it. And, um, and, I, and we said kind of goodbye. It was all a bit of a daze. And I, I walked across the street with my husband and we, oh, we went into Sainsbury's. You know how you do after you've just been offered Absolutely, a record. after or, a life-changing moment. A life-changing moment. We're just, we're, just, well, we're just here, so we'll just pop in and you know, get some <laughs> milk. And, and it, I literally got halfway through the vegetable aisle and just absolutely went crazy, like sc- almost screaming that we got this record deal. <laughs> you know, so it took me like 20 minutes to realise uh, and then that, and that was it, and and that was the record deal. And I, I just thought, I had that moment of wow, all the years I've spent trying to trying to do it, mm. and here I am, doing something totally different. That I, and I, by then I knew that rock choir actually was what I was meant to do. I had, I just had that feeling that all those years of trying and being a teacher and all these, but oh, this is what I was meant to do. Mm. And um, I mean, I'm I'm not a religious or particularly spiritual person, but I I did think, yeah, that this is definitely what I was meant to do because it uses every single thing I've ever, I've ever learnt or experienced. So when that record deal came in, I just it was a gift. I just thought, oh, it's it's, I I'm I'm getting the thing I wanted, but I get to share it with all these people, yeah. and I'm not on my own. Uh, and 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 yeah, that was it was fantastic. Did it feel? getting that deal as you thought it would have felt when you first started having this dream? It it didn't. Well, firstly, because I, I hadn't set it up. I didn't know it was coming. There's no. me thinking movie. They want to make a movie. And then suddenly it was a record deal. Would you have preferred a movie in that moment? Um, no. It's no, a record, always a record no, deal. Always a record deal. <laughs> <laughs> because well, actually overnight, all my, my family had been saying, well, who's going to play me? And my dad said, oh, Steve Martin's going to play me. So, and we were having this hilarious, who would you want to play you? So we'd all been very focused that it was universal as in a movie. Yeah. So, so when it was suddenly a record deal and it was a shift like that. Um, no, it was, it was, um, no, it, it was, it was amazing. I was I, I was just thrilled. I was on mm. another high. Caroline, we could talk for hours and hours. I feel it's been so lovely to talk <laughs> through it all and hear your story. Um, but I think we need to now wrap up with um, with some quick fire questions. Um, so I gave these to you at the start. So you should have had a bit of time to think about these through. Um, so first one, what is your musical guilty pleasure? Okay, I have to say um, I love listening to Bruce Hornsby and the range or Don Don Henley and these are the piano type songs so my yep. favourite is End of the Innocence okay. I, I can't ever imagine bringing it into rock choir but as soon as I play it I'm soothed mm-hmm. and I'll and I love um, the very wordy songs you can tell because I talk all the time <laughs> it's probably that um, but it's uh, End of the Innocence is is an, I'd say a, a very it's an unknown mm-hmm. um, song that I, I love so I would recommend anyone listens to that that's my guilty song anyway guilty pleasure and what song have you sang the most in your life? Oh, without doubt, Annie Lennox walking on broken glass. Okay. Oh, over and yeah, over. Yeah. Over and over. Never get tired. Remember the first time you sang it? Uh, it was at university because the album Diva came out while I was at uni. Yeah, yeah. And my lecturer, Stan Hawkins, bought me the songbook and said, this one is going to be for you. This yeah, yeah. songbook is for you. And so it would have been 94, I think. Okay. Yeah. So finish the sentence for me. Uh, the best uh, pre-performance warm-up is yawning. Yawning. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I can. Yeah. I can feel that now. Yeah. It really well, uh, stretches it, uh, it your core. It stretches. Cords. Opens up. But yeah. also, I find if I'm nervous before a show or any event, I don't feel. I'm not aware that I'm nervous, but I start yawning. Yeah. And it, it's it's too. It's a mechanism that physically that happens naturally when you're nervous because it's opening everything up and allowing you to to breathe again. Yeah, it's to do with oxygen. So yeah, that oh, and um, that. always black coffee in a vocal zone. Okay, I take a I have two vocal zones as well. Okay. I did this morning I before see. I came here. Yeah, <laughs> but as a someone that isn't a vocalist, that's that's wonderful news. But I might try that before recording, just doing a bit of yawning. Yeah, sometimes, yawning, yeah. yeah, sometimes it 
Yeah. Just relax. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, an artist who needs more recognition? The London Community Gospel Choir. Okay. They are the, the most amazing musicians that I've ever met. I saw them recently at the Royal Albert Hall and I'm um, uh, getting friendly with them, actually. And the, the musicianship uh, and their passion for music. They, they've been around a long time, mm -hmm. but they, um, they should be in, in the public eye regularly, I, I believe. Yeah. Okay. And last one. Can you sell the university to me in a sentence? Well, I'm going to use key words. Is that okay? Fine. Go for it. Proactive. Mm -hmm. Cutting edge. Innovative. Special. Oh, love it. Love it. Caroline, thank you so much for coming to see oh, us today. Oh, you're welcome. It's been great. Yeah, thank I you. mean, as I say, we're going to talk for hours and hours on this episode, but um, it's it's been a journey. Well, if my book comes out, of course, yes, doesn't it? Yes, it's you're all going to be book. in the book. We don't know when the book's going to be released, but hopefully soon. Hopefully later this year, 2024. This yeah, year. That definitely. Uh, it's will called be a push. Sing. Sing. Believe it or not. Okay. <laughs> well, there you have it. Um, that brings an end to this episode. Um, look, if, if you love what you're hearing from us, then please do subscribe for more episodes this season. And we'll be back next time.